Welcome back. Today is the first of two talks on how interpretivists seek knowledge. And I will focus on bottom-up as opposed to top-down searches for knowledge. This is the hallmark, after all, of interpretivist uh, social science. The understanding that we need to, if not get inside the heads of actors, understand them and their culture, understand what makes sense in that culture, both as goals and means, and how choices are made and implemented. To offer insight into the interpretivist quest for knowledge, I'm going to talk about Max Weber, the great 19th and early 20th century. He died in 1918, just after the end of World War I. German sociologist. Uh, some of you will be familiar with his uh, best-known work, The Protestant Ethic and the uh, Spirit of Capitalism, and I'm sure very much less uh, familiar with his epistemological and methodological writings. And those are the ones I will draw on for the most part uh, for my argument. Um, Weber was interesting in that he tried uh, to develop a kind of Goldilocks position that incorporated the best of positivism and that of interpretivism. Uh, at the time, the positivist approach was represented in a fierce uh, inter-German debate called the Methodenstreit, the struggle over method, by the Austrian school of economics, and most notably uh, Karl Menge. They were opposed by interpretivists in Germany, led by Wilhelm Dilke, uh, who coined uh, the term uh, uh, Geisteswissenschaft, or cultural sciences, and sharply opposed the Austrian empirical approach to knowledge. Uh, Weber disagreed with the Austrians because he didn't think that universal theories were worth very much and told you nothing about individual cases of interest, even if you had such theories. Uh, he also uh, was dubious about Dilte and his approach to interpretivism because Dilte relied on intuition to get into the heads of political actors he studied. Weber thought that you know, one person's intuition is as good as another. Uh, if that's what you rely on, then there are really no ways of adjudicating among conflicting claims. So with this in mind, um, he laid out um, his own approach. It took the form of causal narratives. And that is in sharp contrast uh, to theories, and especially theories that can be expressed in mathematical terms. Causal narratives, again in contrast to theories, focused on single cases. And this for Weber was very important. A causal narrative uh, would look for what were the seeming factors responsible for an event, an outcome, a development. It could be uh, something uh, discreet like the outbreak of a war or something uh, much more general like the development of capitalism. And Weber believed 
that one of the mistakes of theories was to focus only on immediate causes. Uh, for him, they were a starting point. One tried to construct a causal chain going from the most superficial and immediate causes of an event back to deeper, underlying, ultimately more fundamental, uh, if not deterministic, explanations. And those would be found at the cultural level. In his view, this was a way of linking agency to structure, of making connections between what actors thought and did, and the ways in which society as a whole had shaped those beliefs and choices. So Weber's starting point uh, for these causal narratives uh, was his uh, belief in the individual as the ontological level for analysis. Uh, this too it sharply differs from positivist theories which tend to uh, rely on structures that are, as we've noted, top-down. Now, Weber thought, and I think most instructivists, excuse me, most interpretivists would agree, that it's important to focus on the individual because all political action is the behavior of individuals. We can talk about states. We can make the mistake, as many rationalists do, uh, realists, of personifying states, treating them as if they were individuals, but they're not. And by studying individuals, uh, we actually come to grips with the decisions uh, that result in political action. Uh, this doesn't mean that Weber believes that individuals act purely on the basis of their own beliefs, goals, expectations, subjective understandings of the environment. These are very much influenced by the society around them, by the elite to which they belong, by their own place in the structure of, of the society. So there is a back and forth, and to understand individuals, we have to take these broader considerations into account. In some cases, they may entirely determine how individuals behave, but in many others, they're simply the framework in which agency is allowed a fair degree of latitude. So individuals are the ontological level, and the second key point uh, for Weber is rationality. And rationality for Weber means two very different things. In the first place, he applies it to any conceptions, uh, frameworks that we use for purposes of analysis. They have to be logical and consistent and therefore rational. One of the hallmarks of scientific enterprise and social scientific enterprise for Weber is this kind of logical consistency. But this doesn't mean that the people we study are rational. And here uh, Weber is very clear that in the first instance there are different kinds of reason. There is something, for example, he called Zweckrational, or reason for particular ends, proportional uh, reason, that is equivalent to what we call instrumental reason, that is the basis of realist and rationalist approaches to international relations. But it's only one kind of reason for Weber. There is something called Wertrational, which uh, refers to people who are motivated by their value commitments and may behave very differently and seek different ends 
than people who frame a problem in terms of instrumental rationality. Weber also recognized that people act habitually without serious reflection on why they're doing something. Uh, just they've done it this way. Society has socialized them into doing this way and they accordingly act this way. So it's central for Weber when we look at any set of decisions that we try to understand what kind of rationality motivated the people involved. But secondly, even if we know this, it doesn't mean that they act effectively in terms of that rationality. They may make misjudgments. They may, for any kind of reason, not behave as we think they should. So let's stay with instrumental rationality since it's so central to other models of international relations theories. It assumes that people make efficient choices between means and ends, that people uh, rank the ends they seek, they make trade-offs about their likelihood. Often they don't. And there's lots of psychological evidence uh, to this effect. Uh, they may also have, uh, um, they may be aroused emotionally, particularly when considering the use of force. They may be unduly sensitive to suggestions of others. They may deny, distort, discredit information that uh, threatens their goals or strategies. So for Weber, rationality, once we know what kind we're talking about, is uh, nothing more than an ideal type. Uh, it's something that doesn't really exist in the real world, but it's a benchmark that we use to assess behavior in the real world. And by doing so, we ask ourselves just how close does the behavior of the actors we're studying conform to instrumental rationality. If it does, well, we can construct our causal narrative with no further ado. If not, we then have to ask, well, why? Was it incomplete information, which is the preferred explanation for rationalists on almost every occasion? Uh, was it a bias of some kind, that they were highly motivated to behave in a particular way and insensitive to information that suggested it didn't work? Uh, did they misframe the problem? Uh, think they were addressing one kind of issue when they were addressing another or change their frame of reference in the course of behaving. Uh, one of the things uh, I found in uh, repeated studies of deterrence encounters was that one or both sides would often enter uh, such a conflict uh, convinced that the most important goal was defending state interests or their own political position, but in the course of a crisis that escalated, became emotionally aroused, changed their goal, and what was now important was not giving in to the other side. This was important as an end in itself, I won't be bullied, but it was also important because they reasoned that if they gave in on this occasion, they would only be confronted by even greater demands the next time around. So, we have to really think about the ways in which behavior deviates from ideal types and then look at all kinds of explanations, domestic politics, uh, psychology, reframing to understand why. Finally, uh, Max Weber argued that we have to make use of counterfactual experiments. What did he mean? by counterfactual uh, experiments. Uh, a counterfactual is a what if. Uh, uh, what if I were not making these videos and you were not listening? What else might you be doing? Or what if I had not paired off with this person? Uh, would my life be better or worse? Uh, who else might I have paired off with? And, how do I think that might 
have worked out. Uh, people use counterfactuals all the time to both make assessments and to work their way through problems. Max Weber thought it was useful in working your way through causal claims. If you think that X was a principal cause of Y, you then had to ask yourself as part of your analysis, what if there was no X? Would there still have been a Y? And to develop uh, reasonable protocols for conducting these counterfactual experiments. I won't elaborate on that today because I'm going to give another talk on counterfactuals, which is a, a long-standing intellectual interest of mine. Now, Weber's approach to interpretivist social science is a very valuable one, but um, it's no silver bullet, so to speak. There are problems with it, as there are with any approach to uh, social science, and particularly international relations. Uh, one of the problems is that he hopes that the use of ideal types and the assumption of some degree of rationality will uh, obviate the need to get into the kinds of explanations uh, that I've mentioned, the domestic politics, psychology, uh, frameworks. Uh, but in fact, uh, in the real world, rationality is just an ideal type, as Weber supposed. And the gap between human behavior and the ideal type is pretty great. So you can't but avoid getting into the heads of people. And uh, when you do that, it becomes uh, an elaborate but important exercise. So I'll give you one example. Uh, in our book, We All Lost the Cold War, uh, Janice Stein and I reconstructed two critical Cold War crises, the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 and the October 1973 crisis in the Middle East. We did our best to get into the heads of policymakers by examining the documents, uh, memos they had written or other people had written after talking to them at the time, doing interviews with policymakers uh, after the event, and in formulating our understandings of why they acted as they did, we looked at other policies to see if there was a pattern of behavior and painstakingly um, put together a picture. Now, there's never a smoking gun. You can never say definitively this is what caused something. At most, you can make a plausible case that based on the existing evidence, this is a compelling explanation. And in some cases, there may well be alternative compelling explanations that require equal consideration. Um, the deeper issue here, and on which I will end my talk, is that understanding why people behave as they do is undoubtedly the critical step in understanding policy and offers uh, far more insight, and particularly in single cases, than top-down approaches that rely on theory. However, uh, reconstructing singular cases, while they lead to uh, good, or can lead to good causal narratives, uh, they tell you little about other cases. At best, they create uh, a pattern or a set of expectations that can be a starting point for narratives in other cases. But more importantly, uh, the actions of political leaders is really only the starting point of a good analysis in international relations. We want to know about outcomes, why certain things happen, and they're often the result of the behavior of multiple actors. And these outcomes frequently vary from what these actors intended or what they expected. 
So somehow we have to study the process of aggregation to understand outcomes. And interpretivism has not yet really grappled uh, with this aspect of the problem. Thank you very much.